Okay. I'm recording now. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you saved me. Okay. Well, Martin was there for a second, and now he disappeared. So I guess he'll he'll try again, and I'll let him in when he comes. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for an opportunity to come together to study your word. I pray that you would just give us insight and understanding as we address this new letter that Paul was writing to this second letter to the church at Corinth. And that you would open up our hearts and minds and let us understand what it is that Paul was going through. And we can see it in the same light as those things that we go through. But that we can see that no matter what adversities we go through in following you, Lord Jesus, that you provide comfort. And we trust you in this. And so, Lord, Holy Spirit, just give us insight, I pray, and let, let this study you know, write itself on our hearts so that we can live it out in a way that brings you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, here comes Martin again. Let's see if he can make it in this time. Come on, Martin. You can make it. Okay. Okay, Martin's connecting. All right. Come on, Martin. There he is. Hello, Martin. How you doing, brother? Hi. Took me a while. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, there, you tried once, and then you fell off the wagon, and so yeah, we had to pick you back up. <laughs> it, was, it, it was not connecting. I'm, yeah, glad to be, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Amen. And glad to have you here, brother. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. About, oh, go ahead, Victor. You're talking about alcoholism all night long. Alcoholism? Peter, yeah, you said Peter got stoned, or Paul got stoned. Oh, yeah, he got stoned to death. I mean, that was pretty heavy stoning. Well, I don't know if they had weed back then. Yeah, these figures of speech always get in the way, don't they? Metaphorical <laughs> stuff. But anyway, okay. So remember, Paul wrote this letter about one year after he wrote the first letter, and he the time frame was about 10 years before he died. He died around 65, 66 AD. He wrote this letter about 56 AD. And so we're going to pick up where we're going to look and see what it is that he's talking about. Now, Paul usually gives the same greeting that he typically does in his letters, okay? I mean, he usually brings in, you know, the the grace and peace issue, that grace and peace we with you. So let's Let's take a look at that. He starts out in chapter one here. He says, Paul, an apostle. Notice that he starts off right off the bat, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And this will be something that he'll have to defend, okay? Because not all, not everyone saw him as an apostle. See, they always felt that the apostles had to be those that had been with Jesus and had spent time with Jesus and had seen him been with him, experienced the fact that he had died, resurrected, and ascended. And so when Matthias was voted in, if you remember, uh, we don't hear about Matthias anymore other than the event where they actually voted him in. Remember, he was competing against this other guy, and they, they threw, rolled the dice to see who it was that was going to come into that slot that Judas had vacated. And it was Matthias that was voted in. Well, in this case, sometimes, uh, you know, when, if you remember when uh, James and John, the brothers, right, the Bonargi brothers, you know, uh, had, had asked Christ if they could have basically thrones to rule with him. Remember that? Remember how they wanted to have thrones to be there. He said when they had told Jesus, hey, when you go into your kingdom, remember us, you know, let us have a throne by you. And, and Jesus said, well, that's not for me to give. That's for my heavenly father. Well, but one time Jesus talked to Peter and said that there will be 12 thrones where you will rule with me in heaven, basically, and you will, you will judge from those thrones. So apparently there are 12 seats up there. So the question is, and, and this is more a hypothetical kind of question more than it is anything. Is it possible, you know, uh, well, let me just ask it. 
is it possible that Matthias, they jumped the gun on Matthias and that it was actually Paul that was supposed to fill that 12th seat? It's, I believe so. Yeah, it, it, it kind of makes sense that way. But I mean, you see in the Bible where a lot of times, you know, man tends to jump the gun on, on some plan that God has. Uh, and we saw it with uh, Sarah and Abraham, right? You know, they jumped the gun, not waiting for the son of promise. And now today we got the Arabs because of that jumping the gun, right? I mean, eh, so, I, I mean, think, yeah. I would think Paul, because you don't hear much of Matthias anymore. Well, that's what I'm saying. Other than that, when they voted him in because of what that Psalm said, that, you know, that a, a slot was needed to be filled. Yeah. Other than that specific event in Acts, when they threw the dice, rolled the dice, and Matthias was voted in, yeah, you never hear about Matthias anymore. So I, I don't know. We'll know when we get to heaven, because God already have it in order, right? right. All we know is that God is in control, and what is going to happen will happen. So, but, I mean, I just personally think, I think Paul was that 12th apostle. He was the one that filled in the slot. On my account, I think that that's what was supposed to be. And, but Paul is definitely one of the apostles, okay? So, he says, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. In other words, God chose him to fill that role through Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus is the one that met him on the road to Damascus, right? I mean, he's the one then. Remember in Galatians where it talks about that he went off into the desert for three years? I believe he actually was out there with Jesus. I mean, I don't think Jesus was there corporally with him, but I think he had a relationship with Jesus during that time in the desert where he told him all these things that were going to happen. Because sometimes you hear Paul writing about prophetic things, things that are yet to come. So... Since Paul had to get that from somewhere, God had to have revealed that to him. So I think he spent those three years while he was in the desert that it talks about in Galatians. I think, I think it was kind of like the same three years, you know, that, that Jesus was with the original 12 disciples, you know, kind of thing. I mean, that's just my extrapolation based on what I've seen in the scriptures. But... I, I guess for me, it won't be fully answered till I get to heaven. And if I really care at that point, uh, <laughs> but I know that if it's still a question that I have, I'll have the answer as soon as I get to heaven. So, uh, but that's just a, something that's crossed my mind because of what's in scripture. Okay. So he says, an apostle Christ Jesus by the will of God, God did it. And Timothy, our brother, so he's obviously with Timothy when he's writing this letter. Uh, and he says, to the church of God that is in Corinth, with all the saints who were in the whole of Achaia. Achaia is the province with, which is around Corinth, okay? And uh, as a matter of fact, Greek, uh, Athens is in Achaia. So uh, when you look at that, you say, okay, so he's, he's writing this not only to the Corinthian church, but to all the saints that are in the Achaia district. So well, this will be kind of like a circular letter too, even though it's to Corinth specifically, it'll be shared out with other churches that are in the Achaia district there. So he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is his typical uh, introduction, you know, in his letters. I mean, a lot of times I look at the grace is more relevant, I think, in terms of what Gentiles understand, and peace is more what the Jews understand, because, hey, it's for everybody, right? Grace and peace, shalom. But, I mean, all of us are subject to grace and peace in Christ Jesus. And he says, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's his introduction, because, hey, we're talking to the church, right? And then Jesus is the head of the church. So he's bringing that into the introduction. So now he, he jumps from there. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those 
who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, he starts it off with the comfort side. Instead of starting it off with suffering, he starts it off with the comfort, that God provides comfort to those who are his children. Okay, we're adopted. We understand that from Romans 8. Romans 8 makes it clear that when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we are adopted into the family of God. And so the Father is the one that adopts us. We become co-heirs with Jesus Christ. So in other words, I mean, we're, we're talking about we have a serious position in the family of God when we come in through his saving grace. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that's significant. And because of that, we know that we have a place prepared for us in heaven because Jesus had said that, hey, I, for I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. So when Jesus ascended, that's what he, he's been doing. He's been making a place for all of those that come into his saving grace. Because, hey, salvation is about a gift, right? And Jesus paid the price so that we could have that gift, and through him, we could have forgiveness of sin as we accept him and repent. So, I mean, so when we look at that, we realize that Paul is saying, hey, but one of the things that we should have as the body of Christ and the unity of Christ, whether it be a local body or church universal, is that we should be able not only receive comfort from the Father, but we should also be able to comfort one another in our in the things that we have to go through in the world so as we go through these things we can be assured that we can keep our eyes on the lord and that no matter what we go through we can still receive his comfort no matter what those difficulties are that we go through and paul will start explaining that here in a minute where he starts saying look look at all the things i had to go through and even to the point where i despaired of death but yet God gave me his comfort, even through those difficult situations. So, I mean, when you say you despair of death, that's almost like you want to commit suicide. You know, I mean, you're depressed, you're, you're just downtrodden, and it's like, man, that's, that's a real low place to be. It's a real dark place to be. But I mean, hey, to have a wonderful hope and know and knowledge that God is going to be there with you and he's going to comfort you through it. I mean, that gives you strength. And that's what Paul is going to be talking about here. So notice that he starts out with the comfort in our, in any and all our affliction, God is there first. And then because since he does it for us, we need to do it for one another. We need to care for one another while, you know, here on earth, those who are believers. So in verse 5, he says, For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. So that's what I was saying earlier, that when Jesus said, Hey, if they persecuted me, guess what? They're going to persecute you too. Well, the reality is that comes with the territory. That's Remember how when you come into salvation, one of the things Jesus said is that we need to count the cost. And he said that in that parable of the guy that was trying to build a tower, but he didn't have enough money. And so he only got the foundation laid and he, that was as far as he got. And Jesus said, that's why you have to count the cost. In other words, you can't come in to a relationship with Jesus Christ and say, well, I'm only willing to go this far. This is the only capital that I have that'll get me through. And that's it. One of the things is that when we, surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what? We're saying, Lord uh, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life from now on. I want you to run this, you know, be my all in all, and that I want this body to be a vessel surrendered for your use to reach out to others and, and to bring you honor and glory. So in essence, we turn everything over to him, and we become basically a tool and I hate using that word, but we become a, let me use servant, servant's better, a servant for him, a friend, because you said, you know, a servant doesn't know what his master does, but so now I call you friends. So we become his friends 
to as a servant friends to be able to do what needs to be done uh, now that's double talk servant friend has said i won't call you servants but um but you get you get the point the point is is that we go do good works for him not because that gains us anything but it brings him honor and glory when we do those good works that he's prepared for us since before time, right? Ephesians 2.10 talks about that. So that's why Paul is saying, hey, when you go through the sufferings, don't worry about it because we share, it, not only do we share in those sufferings because Jesus went through it and it lets us become part of what Jesus experienced, but also, that in the process of going through whatever we have to go through and following Christ, he provides, he shares abundantly in that comfort with Jesus Christ. So he's the one that provides it, okay? So the comfort comes with the relationship with Jesus Christ. So, I mean, I think that's important to understand because a lot of times we tend to look at the circumstances and the situations as being overwhelming. And a lot of times we don't say, well, Lord, you know, just... I, you say that I'm not supposed to worry about anything, but in all things, I'm supposed to turn them over to you through prayer, supplication with thanksgiving. And then the result of that is that you, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will be mine. Okay. In Christ Jesus. So that's that comfort. I think that that's what he's talking about here is that type of peace that surpasses understanding is, is that comfort that God provides as we turn those concerns and worries over to him. So in verse six, he says, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort. Now he's talking about we, he's talking about Paul, Timothy, Silvanus, Silvanus who is Silas. Remember Paul and Silas ended up in jail. Silvanus is Silas. And he's talking about those that are with him. He's saying, if we are afflicted, in other words, Paul, Timothy, um, Silas, uh, and uh, oh, Apollos, and others that were with him, hey, they had to endure persecution. They had to endure jail time. They had to endure other difficulties in spreading the gospel. So he's saying, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. He says, hey, I don't mind going through that affliction if you are going to be benefited by God's salvation and it's going to provide you a better sense of Christ and a comfort in Christ. He says, that's fine if we're afflicted, you know, because we're doing it so that God's word can spread and that you guys become the beneficiaries of it. And because of that, it's for your comfort and salvation and we are comforted when that happens. So in other words, what he's saying is as we are effective in reaching out to people and spreading the good news because of the Holy Spirit's work, then that encourages them. And through that encouragement, they're comforted. So it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same suffering that we suffer. So now he turns the table around and he says, hey, but when you go through and you endure that suffering, he, he said that we suffer, he says, hey, there, we can also be comforted in the fact that we know that basically what we provided you is all you need to be comforted through that suffering, that God is there. He, you just got to keep your eyes on the Lord, and that's what he's talking about in sharing of that comfort. So Christ provides, Christ provides all the comfort, but it builds us up as followers of Jesus Christ, as missionaries, as those who reach out to promote the gospel to others, that when we have, when we give the word of God to others, even if we have to go through persecution in the process of doing it, we're comforted through Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. And then they also are comforted in the fact that they have now received the good news and have assurance and hope in their lives. So you see where he's going with this comfort, that comfort and salvation and following Christ are all tied together. Suffering's in there too, but it's all tied together. But we don't focus on the suffering. We focus on the comfort that God provides through that suffering. Because, hey, actually, did you know that it brings God honor and glory when we go through that suffering and 
don't let it hold us down because we keep our eyes on him and trust Christ, God, to get us through it. You see, see the issue? And so that brings God the honor and the glory. And that satisfies one of the main purposes of why we're here on this earth. Our purpose is not only be conformed to the image of his son, but to bring honor and glory to God in everything we do. So, so Ted? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. So going back to those verses, for, in order for us to learn to be confident in God, we first have to suffer. And the problem is we as, as human beings, we, we don't want to suffer. I mean, who wants to suffer to the United States? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you know what exactly. I mean? It's the opposite because obviously the gospel that's been presented today, uh, we are allergic to suffering. So according to the verses, for us to learn to be conquering God, we, for, we first have to suffer. Otherwise, how, how else can we learn uh, to comfort other people if we, ha if we have not gone to, gone to suffering in life? Amen. Well put. Well put, Martin. Yeah. And, I mean, Martin makes that point really well because, I mean, the issue is, guess what? There are a lot of Christians out there, or at least professed Christians, that, man, they, they avoid suffering at any cost. You know, they, they make sure that, hey, I'm, I mean, God wants me to be blessed in everything. He doesn't want me to suffer. He doesn't want me to have difficult times. And so what they do is they avoid anything that puts them into a position where they might have to suffer. If things start getting a little hot, guess what? They back out. They say, no, I'm not going down that road because, you know, I'm not going to have to go through that. Well, the thing is, is, as Martin says, it comes with the territory. We will have to go through suffering. As, as those who are believers in Christ, to do what God wants us to do, we will have to go through suffering. And what that goes back to is the fact that God disciplines those he loves. Okay, And part of what we are doing and going through suffering is God teaching us. He's teaching us to keep our eyes on him. And he's teaching us how to be able to endure through any situation and stay strong in the faith. That's what he's doing. And that's how he comforts us. It's because guess what? The first time you go through a problem of suffering in your life and you see that God is able to bring you through it, guess what? The next time it's not as problematic anymore because you say, well, God took care of me last time. And then the next time you go through it, it's even less of a problem because you, you've you already experienced twice. So experience helps. And that's God developing you as, he, as you go through these different things. Plus, like Paul is saying, hey, Jesus went through it. We're going to go through it because that's, that just comes with the territory. It's part of following Christ. Yeah, Mark. In, in order for us to grow, we have to go uh, through suffering. Amen. It's like, you know, how are you going to obtain your diploma unless you go to school first? You know what I mean? That's it's right. The same, it's the same concept. We, our lives, are, we're going through school right now. So for us to learn, we have to go through the situation in our lives. That's right. That's right. And uh, one a good point that Martin brings up, is, and I'll just tie into our brothers and sisters in nations and countries where Christ is forbidden for all intents and purposes, those that come to Christ in those nations, they grow a lot faster and they find greater uh, comfort, I think, in Christ because when they come to Christ, guess what? They pretty much have a bullseye painted on them because they aren't supposed to come to Jesus Christ. They're supposed to go to their communistic religion or to Muslimism or whatever. They've got to say in their, those ways of believing, so if you decide, no, I'm going to follow Christ instead, and I'm going to do what Christ wants me to do, you put yourself in a very difficult position, even to the point where sometimes the, those governments or the people themselves will kill your family if just one person accepts Jesus Christ. In Iran, that's happened, you know, with Christians these days. And Christianity, though, is flourishing. You know, you would think that Christianity would be falling off because, man, I mean, these, these, uh, the, the Iranians are, are really against Christianity, and they don't want to see anybody leave Shia, you know, into 
uh, Christianity. And so, man, if somebody does in a family, they'll kill off the whole family. Um, now that's something, you know, and, and what you see is you see a lot more growth and a lot more development quicker in those, in those nations than you see here in the United States where we're more comfortable. We're not really persecuted at any real level when you think about it compared to them. Because I mean, they're, they're, they're potentially uh, could be put to death any day because of the fact that they've accepted Jesus Christ as their savior. Now, I think that's coming here eventually. But I mean, when you think about it, we have freedom of religion for all intents and purposes today. So, I mean, we don't really have a problem in, in that respect. And I think that's why we don't grow as fast spiritually here because, well, we don't really have a lot of pressure on us like our brothers and sisters in Indonesia or in Iran or in China or, and I could go on and on with other nations, you know, Sri Lanka and whatnot, where they, they, I mean, you claim Christianity and you, you pretty much put yourself on, you know, the chopping block. So, but what that does though, is if you accept Jesus Christ in a situation like that, hey, you have no one to turn to but Jesus for your support, your comfort, your strength, you know, it, it's all in God. You have to trust him, you know, to be able to follow Christ in those kind of uh, societies. You know what I'm saying? So, so, I mean, that's, I know what Martin's saying, because, I mean, that's where, you know, get developed the fastest. As, as a matter of fact, I've heard a pastor say once that the place where you grow the quickest in Christ Jesus is when you're under persecution. If you're not under persecution, it's like, well, I got time. I can do it anytime. But when you're under persecution, then you have to trust the Lord. You, you're forced, you know, to look to him for your, all your needs because, hey, your situation is dire. So, yeah, exactly. So any questions on comfort and being in Christ and suffering? And what comes with persecution? Yeah, Mark. Basically, where it says then, verse 9, that says, you know, we go through all this, so we learn to rely, you know, on God, not on ourselves. And, and, and uh, you know, if we believe in the providence, providence of God, uh, that anything that happens to our lives is because has a, God has allowed it. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. But, the, yeah. but there are things that, that, we, but that we need to know that we're going to go through. Look, we, we, we live in a depraved world. It's a simple world. So we are going to get sick, right? Right. You are going to have problems with other people. So that's normal. So we, we shouldn't be surprised when we have those situations come to our life, especially Amen. sickness today, because we're not exempt because we're Christian. Amen. So that happens to the heathen. It happens to us, us also. Exactly. But nothing's going to happen unless it goes to the providence of God. Amen. Amen. So, yeah, let, so let's pick up in verse 8 there so that we can get to where Martin was talking about, because yes, exactly. For look, at, look what verse 8 says. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. Hey, go read any of Paul's letters. And, and in all of his letters, guess what? There are Jews following him that are stirring up crowds behind them and making things really difficult for him, and even trying to change people's focus from the gospel into some other gospel, like Galatians talks about. And so Paul's talking about all these things that they're experiencing. It's not just those Jews that are coming, but there are others too that say, hey, how come you, you know, you, you, uh, oh, remember the lady that was the prophetess that could tell the future? And she kept coming and molesting Paul as they were going through, I think it was Thessalonia, Thessalonica. And <laughs> she was saying, oh, you're, you're, you know, you're from the, you're teaching the son of God. Jesus, the son of God, and obviously kept interrupting him trying to teach. Finally, he got fed up with it. And he basically told Satan to come out of that woman, you know, come out of her. Well, the demon <laughs> came out. Well, now the lady couldn't do her little, you know, fortune telling and foretelling of things. And so the people got mad, right? 
And I mean, because they said, hey, now we can't make money because we were making money off this girl. And uh, now the girl can't do any prophecy. And so look at the riot that started up there, right? And I mean, because of that, you know, I mean, these are types of things that just wherever Paul went, a lot of people ended up having issues with it. Um, so, yeah, I said Th Thessalonica. It might have been if Ephesus because he said, remember where they took him into the, uh, like, uh, what's it called? Uh, I think it was Ephesus because they kept going, great is Diana right, right after all the riot broke out. That's I think right. It was Ephesus. The God of the Ephesians. Yeah, exactly. So, and for two hours, they kept, you know, yelling that. And yeah, so I think it was Ephesus. So, but when you look at things like that, Paul was always dealing with that. And Paul wanted to go in and talk to that crowd, but what did they do? The brother said, no, you're out of here, man, because if you stay. He went, there was a riot. Right. Riots broke up everywhere he went. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about you know, this affliction that they experienced, he was put in jail. Remember Paul and Silas up there in Philippi? Uh, he went to jail, right? And so, but look at what he says. We, the affliction we experience in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. That's what I said earlier is, hey, they went through so much that it, there were times when I, I know that you know how when you start thinking from a fleshly perspective you're just thinking about fight or flight right the old psychological uh, second guessing uh motto yourself. what's that you're second guessing yourself exactly and finally you just say man this can't be you know i mean man i uh, this is can't be what god wants you know and i think sometimes you start getting into that type of thing that you start you know going down the wrong path but in other words what are you saying is hey man we were just I mean, everything was just going so against us that we all, we almost felt like, man, what good is it to be alive? You know, remember he had said, I'd rather go be with Christ, you know, but I stay here. You know, I'd rather die and be with Christ than hang out here on earth. So, I mean, it's that type of a situation that he's talking about. But then in verse nine, just like uh, Martin read, but he said, look, but even in that type of uh, depression, that type of negativity that we had in life he says indeed we felt that we had received the sentence of death but look what remember we were talking about that but god uses these types of situations to develop us to teach us he says but that was to make us rely not on ourselves but on god who raises the dead in other words now what he's saying is hey even if and we were to be put to death. God can still raise us if he still has a, a, a plan and purpose for us. Because remember that time they stoned him and they carried him out of the city? They thought he was dead. And Paul wasn't even sure if he had actually died. But God raised him up, whatever the case was, either he was right next to dead or dead. And God raised him up. He came back in. Remember that? He had been stoned. I mean, somebody that gets stoned like that, I mean, imagine all the broken bones and stuff that you're going to have, you know, with a stoning like that. I mean, Ken, yeah. Can I ask a question about that instance? Yeah. Is that the time that he, um, he mentions that he was out of body when he talks about, I knew a man that was out of body in the body, something like that. Right, right. Is that when he, when he experienced no. that? No, that was a different event. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. So, I mean, when you look at that, I mean, and you say, wow, you know, Paul endured a lot. I mean, when you read his, you know, his letters and you look at his resume of those issues he had to go through, Paul did indeed have to endure a lot. Okay. Even to the point where he was martyred for the Lord, right? He was beheaded. So, uh, but, but, so we look not to rely on ourselves. See, this is the real key right there, what he says. Rely not on ourselves, but on God. And we can rely on God because guess what? He has the power even to raise the dead if that's what he wants to do. I mean, now that's power, you know, and I, I, that's what he's trying to indicate is, hey, we rely on an omnipotent God, not just some, you know, 
uh, God that has some magic tricks, tricks in a bag, but he is all powerful. He's omnipotent. And so we can rely on him. And look what he says. And by relying on him, he delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. So in other words, Paul had already, remember I said earlier that once you've gone through a persecution once and you see God and you kept your eyes on the Lord and God brings you through it, that it strengthens you. And then the next time it's easier. And then the next time it's even easier, easier, because you know that God's in control and that he can take care of you no matter what. Well, that's what he's talking about here. God delivered us. He, God, delivered us from such a deadly peril. And, and he says, not only did he do that then, but guess what? He will deliver us. So he, in other words, this is Paul's faith talking that says, since he did it then, guess what? He can do it any time that it comes about. So he will deliver us. It's a statement of fact that's an ongoing you know, fact that says, hey, from now until whenever, God will deliver us from any bad situation that comes, from any persecution, from any suffering. He will deliver us. So Paul's certain about that. And he says, so that's why we can have faith in the Lord. We can keep our eyes on him because he's, he's all powerful and he loves us and he wants the best for us. And he wants us to be developed, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And so that's why we can trust God that no matter what, he's there for us. We can rely on him, not on ourselves. So then he says, on him, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. So in other words, hey, it's going to happen again. It's not something that, you know, just happens once and then that's it, you know, kind of like, okay, I passed that test. That one's a done deal. Now I've got my certificate. I won't deal with that again. No, guess what? It's coming again. But look what he said. But we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Just like he said here, he will deliver us. So in other words, when you trust God to do it, He's, he's there. And, and as you see God do it in his supernatural way, I mean, it gives you faith and hope to see that God will do it the next time too, and the next time too, and in the greater ways. And that's the beauty of following Christ, is that you see his mighty works carried out as you go day to day, and you live for him day to day. So in verse 11, you also must help us by prayer. So he's making it important. He's making it imperative, just like he told the church at Thessalonica in First Thessalonians five twelve that we should pray for them. And he says, pray without ceasing in First Thessalonians five twelve. I mean, prayer is essential. Verse seventeen. Oh, is it seventeen? First Thessalonians five seventeen. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, there, Margaret. So praying without ceasing is important, but praying is essential. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, guess what? We should be praying for each other. We should be praying, lifting up others, because that's another way that God provides us help and support, is, is through our prayers to him for one another. Okay? And that's what he's saying. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted us through the prayers of many. Now you say, well, wait a minute, what's he talking about here? What he's talking about is that if you pray for a brother or sister, or let's say you have a prayer list of certain missionaries that you pray for on a regular basis. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think I have seven or eight that I pray for on a regular basis. Um, but what he's saying is that by praying for them, you become active with them in whatever they're doing. So in other words, you're going to get credit from God for actually keeping them in prayer and asking God to be there with them. And so your prayer brings you together with them wherever they are around the world. And that's what he's saying. That's why he's saying, you must, keep, you must also help us by prayer. See, it's about helping through their prayer. So prayer helps them carry out what it is that they're going to do. And he says, so that many will give thanks on our behalf. Many will give thanks because, hey, 
they're getting blessed through the prayers that they're doing for the ministry that Paul's doing. And then they're, get, they're becoming blessed as part of that ministry through prayer. And say, so for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So then Paul, in retrospect, is also blessed through those prayers. And God is able to use him more effectively through the prayers of the saints. So prayer is essential in the body of Christ, universal. Okay, well, local and universal. Because, I mean, it's how we address our need. It's how we humble ourselves before God. But we address the need, the fact that we need him to be there to not only use his Holy Spirit in wondrous ways through these people that we're praying for, but also that he will protect them, that he will guide them, that he will bless them, and that he will make the, you know, the message of the gospel spread even more as they're out there doing their missionary work. And that's how somebody should pray for me too. Lord, help Ted when he goes and witnesses to somebody. You know, just be there with him. Give him the right words to say. Let the Holy Spirit, you know, speak through him. I mean, when Donna and, and a group, a couple others and I, we go out witnessing, I mean, we'd always pray. You know, we'd always pray before. And Donna had a group that would be praying for us, you know, that she was always in contact with, and they'd be praying for us. And when we go out, we, we have, you know, uh, levels of effectiveness because of those prayers as we went out and, you know, shared the news, the good news, or witnessed the people, in, you know, in their homes. So, I mean, these are real, so prayer is essential and important. It's an ingredient that is part and parcel of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. It says that the, what the Lord has going is important. And we need Christ to be involved in it collectively, not just for them, like Donna and I and the others that were with us that were out there doing the work, but for those that were doing the praying remotely, too. It's because we all come together. See, a lot of times we don't see that. We, we say, oh, no, if you're just praying for them, you're not really part of that because they're the ones that are out there suffering. No. We're all collectively part of the body of Christ. We're all collectively united in that sense. And so now if God calls us to go out there, then yeah, we will go out there too. But in the meantime, hey, be, be elevating them in prayer and let God be the one that helps work through them so that the indigenous people can be developed, saved, I mean, saved and developed so that then they can reach out to others too you know, in, mm -hmm. in their area. Yeah, go ahead, Don. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I thought you were done. No, um, that's fine. Like what I always tell my prayer partners, and you mentioned that about, well, that you're, we're on the front line and they're not, but the story in the Old Testament about David when um, they came back from battle and somebody had kidnapped all their wives and taken all their stuff. <laughs> and so half of them went over to um, get the stuff back and half of them stayed behind to guard the stuff. And when they came back, the people that went and did the fighting said they weren't going to split the loot with the people that stayed home to guard the stuff. Yeah. And there would have been somebody there to guard the stuff when they left the first time. <laughs> they wouldn't have lost everything to begin with. So he said they all get the same reward. So exactly. those, those that are out on the front line are um, out on the front line fighting. And those that are home praying are the ones guarding the stuff. That's yeah. kind of my, uh, and we all get the same that's, reward. That's, 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 that's a good my way of looking at it. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Mark. You know, I was listening to uh, John Piper and this verses here. You know, he brought something up and it's right here. Where it says, uh, "So that many will give thanks on our behalf." So he was saying that God loves to receive thanks. So and it's exactly what you were saying. Like, if we pray for you, let's say we we you ask us to pray for you for any situation. When God answers this prayer, we all basically share. The, the blessing because we all pray for a situation so we all going to give thanks to god that's what it says there so 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 that many will give thanks a lot of instead of one person giving thanks many will give thanks so we mean god will receive more glory and, and god loves to receive thanks and yeah. that's, that's that's the advantage of corporate prayer because you know both both they didn't have to ask the, the, the church to pray for them right we just well, get on his knee and pray for himself, right? right. But he's asking the church collectively 
to pray for him. And That's I think right. we, we're not taking advantage of that in our churches today. We're not praying collectively. I agree. I agree. Because that's, that's what this you here in verse 11, the verse that Martin is talking about, this you is plural. It's not singular. It's a you plural. He's talking, like Martin said, he's talking to the church aggregate, not just to a single believer. A lot of times we tend to read this and think, oh, he's just saying you individually, like he's talking to Ted. I should be praying. No, he's talking about you plural the collective church should be praying and help us by prayer so yeah martin is right i mean it's it's a collective praying that also that brings you know the power of god because hey guess what the the holy spirit can do a better work through all of us together than just through one person alone okay it's just god's economy that's the way god works the more we are united, the more we have together, and the more we come together in that worship to him, that prayer to him, the more glory is brought to him. And that's how God acts. He acts on our prayers. You know, a lot of times people say, no, nah, no, nah, God's already got it planned. He's going to do what he's going to do. True, true. But he works off of our prayers. You, hey, even in the Old Testament, we see where God repented. And it, it, it's not like God repents in a sense but like god was going to do something a certain way but then he ended up doing it a different way because of what was brought to him okay what was presented to him so to speak so i th i really do believe that our prayers how does the verse go the prayers of a righteous person availeth much isn't that in james that talks about that yes. so i, yes. I mean it's important that we collectively come together, as Mark is saying, and bring those prayers to the Lord collectively. Go ahead, Mark. And, you know, if we really, you know, because, look, we are human, so I forget sometimes. <laughs> do we really do we really believe that, look, every time we, we talk to God, he's going to answer our prayer. He might not say yes right away, or, or he will say no, but our prayers are being answered. Like, we are starting in, in the, the book of Hebrew. You know, we, we come. And, and, and the high, in the name of the high priest, which Amen. is Jesus, so God is attentive to his to his children. Amen. So you know he, he's listening to our prayer. The question is, do we believe when we pray that God is really listening to us? Right. Yeah. Do we truly trust Him to do what He says He will do? Hey. Also in Hebrews, like Martin said, He says, "Hey, come boldly. We can come boldly before the throne of grace." You know. I mean, we can present, I mean, we, I don't think we fully understand what a privilege it is to us to be able to bring things directly to the throne of God and where God actually hears and listens to what it is that we bring. And he makes his decisions based on our prayers. I mean, if you read in Revelation, it talks about that the prayers of the saints are like a sweet savor offering and sacrifice that come up before him. I mean, that's significant, you know, because it's, it's saying it's not, you know, like your prayers are just hitting the ceiling and then they bounce back down. No, if you are a child of God and we as a church collective, whether it's individual or collective, our prayers get to the Lord and he hears them. And you can believe that. So. Amen. So don't minimize that. Don't minimize prayer. It is important. Okay. And, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, and not only that, 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 you know, when God answers our prayer, our faith grows more. Amen. Because like you mentioned before, okay, so, I, you know, I'm going to be reminded, look, God has answered the prayer in the past. So you know what? He will, he, He's going to take care of you. It's like I still remember this time. I'll, I'll make it quick. I have uh, a testimony when I was in New York. I have people that threaten me. Mm -hmm. You know, one one day I was leaving my apartment, and God told me they will not go in, They're not going to touch you. And you know what? By the grace of God, I'm here today. Yeah. So I seen God work in my life. So I could I could trust God that whatever He says, unless God allows it, it's not going to happen. Amen. And and you're right, Martin. I, I mean, I I can't overemphasize that enough that as we see God do something wonderful in our lives, don't forget that the next time you go to him and ask him for something. 
remember that he's done it before. A lot of times I think I see too many Christians that forget the wonderful things God has done in their lives before, and they make it seem like they're starting from square one again each time. It's like, no, it builds. Every time you see God do something wonderful for you, that should give you more faith to move on to bigger and greater things because, hey, God's not limited by what he can do. We're the ones that put the limits on him most of the time. So don't put any limits on God. Actually, he wants to do great and wonderful things for us. So be bold when you come before his throne. Be bold. Okay, any questions so far on what we've looked at in terms of suffering and comfort and prayer? Well, I'd like to add something to what you just said. You were saying that we're supposed to always remember what when God answered our prayers and in the Psalms, um, David says, bless the Lord on my soul and forget none of his benefits. Psalm 103. And all through the um, Old Testament, they kept repeating about going through the Red Sea and about Jericho and all those things because they were reminding themselves yeah. of what God did in the past and keeping their faith. That's how we build our faith is to remember what he did for us in the past. Amen. So that's, you know, just to add to that. Yeah, because God told him, don't forget, remember. Those were things that he told throughout the Old Testament. Don't forget what God has done for you. Remember every day. You know, remember. As a matter of fact, wasn't it in the Shema in Deuteronomy 6 that they were even supposed to be telling their children about what God had done several times a day? In the morning when they get up, when they walk by the wayside, before they get put to bed, and, and, and in between, you know? Right, and writing it on their doorpost. Exactly. I mean, right. That that goes back to the comfort when with what we were comforted because we go through what we went through to help others go through what we went through. Amen. And because of what God draw us through it, we can forget not His benefits, and then we can share with other people that you know this is this is where I was, this is what happened, and this is where I am now. And that's powerful testimony to let people know that God, God did it before, he'll do it again. So. Amen. And, and yeah, we want to tell others and build them up in it because guess what? I mean, if we don't, we forget. And we saw that with the Jews in the Old Testament, right? How quickly they would forget what God had done, right? Isn't it right. amazing? It's like, it's like the seed, you know, the seed has to be watered. Because Jesus said some seed fell on rocky ground and some fell on good soil and different kinds of soil. If we don't remember what he did in the past and keep our house filled with the word, then we're going to forget his benefits. Exactly. Yeah. So we got to keep our eyes on him. Yeah, yeah go right. ahead, Mark. Okay. Okay. Finish with hey, hey. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Donna. Hey, hey, I, hey, I, again, I look, we, we have to look at, okay, the, the Bible said God answers our prayer, right? Right. But as you know, right? God delivered uh, Paul from the situation where he was going through at that time, right? Amen. But as you know, Paul lost his life, right? In other words, he got killed. Yep. My point is this. We need to believe in the providence of God because there will be time. Okay, if it is God's will for him to heal me or heal someone, amen. But if it's not, it's still okay. It's still That's amen. A, you know what I mean? If God is like, it's like uh, what was the, the three guys, uh, Daniel and his, uh, his friend, you know, even if God, even if God does does not deliver us, we still gonna serve Him. Amen. So it's not like okay, we're gonna serve God because oh, He's gonna He's gonna always say yes. No, regardless of what, we're gonna serve Him. Amen. And that's and that's that's you know. But Jesus grow. was, but Jesus was there with them because when He looked inside, He said, "Didn't I throw three guys in there? But there's four in there, and He looks like the Son of God." Yeah. So and they Amen. were in there. They right. were dancing, and, 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 and but, came, but, they didn't even have any smoke on them. Well, it's going to come a point that guys going to live. It's going to happen, yeah. and guys not going to deliver that, that that person, as you know, because it already happened that way. Amen. But for us, it's not a loss, Amen. because like the apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ, and to die is to gain. So regardless Amen. of what, we we still okay. Yep. You're right. You're right, Victor. Sometimes they won't listen. That's right. That's a fact. But yeah, it's okay because our faith is in him. And I'll tell you, the reality is we have a hope that goes beyond life here and now. 
So, hey, whatever happens, happens. And we give God the glory for it all. And we follow him through it all, no matter how it may look. But I really liked what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to King Nebuchadnezzar when he said, King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, we will not bow down to your idol. We will not bend the knee to your idol. Our God has the power to deliver us. But if he doesn't, we will still not bow to you. <laughs> you know, it's so in other words, whatever God wants is more important. And I think they said it really, really well. And God took care of them, as Donna was saying, and Martin was saying. Absolutely. That today with all these people um, bowing down to this Black Lives Matter thing, and then, you know, people are going, there's Christian like sports people that are saying, I'm not bowing down. I'm only bowing down to Jesus. Yep. So they're trying to make us bow down now. I mean. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I know that they're not trying to change your faith by doing that, but it's starting a trend and that's what's unhealthy. Yes, I agree. Spiritually unhealthy. Because I mean, hey, we should only bow down to God. I mean, hey, I, I don't mind putting my hand to my heart when I say the Pledge of Allegiance, because I mean, hey, I, I'm a, 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 a citizen of this country, and, and that's proper. But I'll tell you, I bow to the Lord. So, so anyway, look at verse 12. So he's now talking about some other things. He says, for our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience that we behave in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely towards you. So in other words, what he's saying here is what we've done that is awesome is this, that we didn't, we didn't somehow bamboozle you through earthly wisdom, right? But we did it all through the grace of God and that grace of God was carried on supremely towards you. So, in other words, we didn't do it, you know, with this big philo philosophical drive, but we made it simple and with godly sincerity. So, in other words, when we presented it to you and we came to you, our consciences are right because we did it in the way that presented Christ in the way that he would have done it if he was there. And that's what he's talking about. So that's the boast. The boast isn't, hey, look at me. I'm a better guy than everybody else. Look what I did. I, hey, I helped plant your church or I planted your church. No, it's not boasting like that. That's not what he's talking about. Uh, he's talking about the uh, work that he did. Yeah, Mark. And, and you know how, as you know, there are preachers out there that they twist the word God to manipulate people. Oh, yeah. Basically, the, the apostle Paul is saying, you know what? We look out, for, we didn't look out for ourselves. We look out for you. We Amen. take care of you, not us. That's right. And, and so he, he feels that that's something really to bring out to them. Because I think one of the problems that the Corinthian church was having, they were trying to minimize him. And we'll see that as we go on. And so Paul's trying to say, hey, but look, here was what, here's what I did, you know, but I did it through Christ for your benefit. And the issue is he's, he's kind of laying a groundwork here that's showing that he was doing God's work the whole time. He wasn't doing something of his own strength and of his own desire for getting a pat on the back like the Pharisees were, like what he was before, but he's doing it in a way that is indicative of the fact that he was following Christ in doing what it was that he did. In other words, bringing the grace of God to them, okay? And not through earthly wisdom, but through God's power. And that was what made it supremely toward them, okay? So it's, it's God's power. Paul was being used by God to do this. And it will, you'll see he'll defend his apostleship and that's what he's talking about. He's kind of going in that respect because they were trying to minimize him as, uh, you're, you're nobody, okay? And he's trying to establish groundwork for that. He says, for we are not writing to you anything other than what you read and understand, and I hope you will fully understand. Okay, now he's written to him before, right? Remember we did 1 Corinthians? And so he's saying, uh, 
turn around anything than what you read and understand, I hope you will fully understand. In other words, we're bringing all this forward to you that you understand. Just as you did partially understand us, in other words, when he was with them, apparently they didn't get everything that he had told them. And that's why he had to write that first Corinthian letter because, hey, they obviously weren't getting, they only understood some of the stuff apparently because they weren't living it all out. And so that's why he had to bring them some exhortation through first Corinthians. And he says that on the day of our Lord Jesus, now he's jumping forward and saying, ah, but the day of the Lord Jesus is coming. That's the hope we have. And that on that day of our Lord Jesus, you will boast of us, you will boast of us, and we will boast of you. So in other words, when we're with them, when they're all with them in glory, we can see how we both contributed, and kind of like what Martin was talking about before, that we both contribute to each other. I and mean, hey, we're the body of Christ. It's not like one person does all the all the con all the contribution. As the body of Christ, we all contribute because we're all tied together in unity. And so that's what Paul's talking about here, that, hey, we boast in each other because we're all tied together. It's not like, uh, I, I'm Paul, I'm better than everybody else. No, we all together work to bring God the honor and the glory through Christ Jesus, who is the head of the church. And so that's kind of where Paul is going with this thought process. It's not that he's trying to look for any pat on the back. He's saying, hey, when we get to heaven, you're going to see that we'll all be impressed with each other for what God used us to do in benefit of one another. And that's what we'll be able to say, hey, look, God, man, you did some great work through us, through the church of Corinth, through, you know, the other Christians that were able to build up the body of Christ in that way. So he's, he's looking forward to the wonder that we're going to have in heaven and see how God used us all collectively together to bring the word of God to the people through Jesus Christ. So, uh, so any questions on what he's talking about here as he's starting to build a platform to defend himself um, in terms of what his position is? Okay, so then let's move on to uh, verse 15. He says, because I was sure of this, I wanted to come first so that you may have a second experience of grace. Remember at the end of 1 Corinthians, he provided like a schedule and he says, I wanted to come back to see you again, you know, and if, if it works out, he had put that if in there, if it works out, you know, type of thing. Well, that's what he's talking about. Because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you at first, come to you first, so that you might have a second experience of grace. In other words, he wanted to come back so that they could once again experience directly from Paul, not through a letter, as to those issues that they wanted to talk about and to be able to build them up in Christ Jesus. That's that experience of grace that he's talking about. He wanted to come and have a one up, you know, basically. Uh, a direct confrontation, not confrontation is not the word, but a direct interaction with them in a loving way through Jesus Christ. And that's what he was calling a second experience of grace, if he could have made it back there to them. That's what he's re uh, referring to. And so he's thinking, man, if I could just get back there with you, man, look at what we could do and experience through Christ Jesus together in an experience of grace. Because he said, I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia, which is to the north of them. Okay, Macedonia was that district up there where uh, Philippi is at, okay, and Thessalonica is to the south of it. It's that area up in there. And he said, I want to uh, come back to you from Macedonia but, um, from Mas and have you send me on my way to Judea. Because he had to go back. Remember, he had to carry the money back to the, the, the churches in Jerusalem because they were having a famine out there. So he was collecting money at these places to go back, okay, and carry that money back. But he wanted to get back there before Pentecost. And since he wanted to get back before Pentecost, he was kind of under the gun. And I think he missed being able to visit with Corinth the way he wanted to because of the time crunch and trying to make it back by Pentecost to Jerusalem. And so that's what he's saying. That's what he wanted to happen. 
that he wanted to be able to stop there so that not only could they experience God's grace, you know, together again, but that they then would be able to send them on the way to Judea and probably with the money that he had exhorted them about before or that uh, about helping out the brothers and sisters out there in Jerusalem. So, yeah, go ahead there, Mark. Yeah, I, you know, I apologize, but I'm sorry. I have to step off for a minute. I know you went over verse 14, uh, I guess, before I left, but when, when it's mentioned on the, uh, uh, the day of our Lord, Jesus, uh -huh. you will, they're going to boast, uh, you will boast on us and, and we will boast on you. Right. Uh, is he referring to uh, the day that, that people are going to re receive their recompense, that they are, they are, well, they are these of the day of the Lord? Which, That's which, what I think it is. Yes. Yeah, because they said, okay, it's like, you know, you're having a feast that day. Okay, we, we are boasting. We, you will boast on us and we will boast on you. Yep. So you will think it's that day? The, the day yes, the, I, uh, I really think it is because then, I mean, we boast not in ourselves, mm -hmm. but in how God used us to his honor and glory. Yeah. And That's the, the day, boast. The day of the Lord says there. That's right. And the day of the Lord is we're already up in heaven with him. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Amen. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Amen. So look at verse 17 there. He says, I, this, he's talking about visit now. Okay. He says, was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? In other words, to come down and visit you. Remember at the end of first Corinthians, as I said earlier, he had already said that he wanted to come and visit, but he, there was that big, if, if I can't, if this situation works out, basically he was saying, I want to be there. And if God allows it, I'll be there. But apparently it didn't work out. So he says, was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? That is to come down and visit with them? No. Do I make my plans according to the flesh? In other words, now he's saying, see, the reason I didn't make it there is because it's not me setting up the plans of where I'm going to be. Because I trust the Lord in all this. I put it before him. And if God says, yes, you can go there. Remember earlier when he said, I wanted to go to, and I forget the district, but he says the Holy Spirit forbid it or did not allow it. But instead, then he had that, that prayer, or I mean, that vision of somebody in Macedonia calling him. And he said, now I know where God wants me to go. And he went to Macedonia instead. So that's what he's talking about here. He's saying, I relied on the Lord for providing me where he wanted me to be. I relied totally on God to be the one giving me direction of where he wanted me to be from day to day. And so he's saying, I, I wasn't vacillating. In other words, I wasn't just trying to make you feel good uh, about it and that I really didn't have an intent to go visit you. He's saying, but he, he says, what you have to understand is that even though that's what I wanted to do, he says, I'm not the one making my plans according to the flesh. In other words, I didn't have my spreadsheet out and kind of put you in and said, okay, it's going to work this way. He, he sought God to see if that was what God wanted him to do. So he says, I'm not doing it by the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time. In other words, in other words, waffling. He's saying, I wasn't going to do it by the flesh and waffle on you. That's, that's not who I am. I'm not a person that's a waffler, basically, is what he's saying. That's why he's saying yes, yes, and no, no, basically speaking out of both sides of his mouth. And so he's saying, that's where, yeah. That's where he was vacillating. That's what it would have looked like if he was doing it according to the flesh, yes. Mm -hmm. But he's saying oh. that's not what I was doing. I wasn't doing it according to the flesh. Yeah. Uh, in other words, that's why I wasn't vacillating. Because I did what God wanted me to do, and I was where he wanted me to be, and obviously it wasn't with you. Although I wanted to be with you, God did not allow that to happen at that point in time the way I thought it was going to work out. So yeah, that's yeah. why he's saying, as surely as God is faithful, in other words, hey, I'm looking to God, he's faithful, I trust him, our word to you has not been yes and no. In other words, it's not my word that matters. It's God words, God's word that matters. He says, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, the good news, Silvanus, or as we know him as Silas, and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. So in other words, as 
I'm with these people that God has put me with. And as we look to him, God's the one that is the one that provided the direction. And when God does it, and I, I'm following God's direction, then it's always yes. If, but what he's saying is that I don't know God's direction, you know, uh, marked out for me for the next 10 years. In other words, I'm relying on God day to day to reveal to me what he wants. Although I'm telling you, like at the end of 1 Corinthians, I'm telling you, I will want to go visit you. I don't know if God's going to allow that. I want to, and hopefully if it'll work out, I'll, I'll be there and visit you. But apparently it didn't work out because it wasn't God's plan for him at that point in time. So he's saying, but when I follow God's will in him, it's always yes, because it's going to be according to his will. See, and, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I think the Apostle Paul was being accused by the Corinthian that he wasn't keeping his promise. That's it. Uh, because that word there is hesitating, undecisive. Yeah, and I was, I was reading yes. somewhere, and basically, I guess he has promised in the past that he was going to go by. It didn't happen. So they, the Corinthians are saying, you know what? He forgot about us. He said he was coming. He hasn't come. He's not keeping his words. Right. And, and so they feel like they've been stymied. They're stumped, stymied, you know, oh, by what he said. But Abandoned. That's right. Abandoned. Yeah, good, good word. And so he's just saying, look, guys, it's not about me. Hey, if it was about me doing it by the flesh, then it'd be a different issue. But he says, no, I, I don't work that way. I work through what God wants me to do. And so in what he wants me to do, it's yes. And in this, yes, it wasn't coming to you. It was going to Judea instead. Because remember, he said, I was hoping that you would send me on my way to Judea. That's what he was hoping. Okay. But that wasn't what God worked out. God had it a different way. And so that's what he's explaining to him here as, as Martin talks about. Yeah. So verse 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. In other words, we trust him for it all. It's, so in other words, if you're going to blame anybody, don't blame me for not being here. Basically, you, you're blaming God, you know, because I have to do what God tells me to do. And that's fundamentally what he's telling them here. Look, I... I follow what God says. Yes, I would have loved to be there with you. Believe me, from my heart, as a human being, I would love to spend more time with you. But that wasn't God's plan. That was my plan. And so that's why he didn't make it there. And as Martin said, I think they felt rejected because they didn't. You know, he didn't show up there like he thought he might. Even though you can, when you read it at the end of 1 Corinthians, you can tell he put, you know, uh, he worded it in such a way like, I don't know. There's that big if, if this, if this, you know. So, I mean, it still comes down to trusting God and that God was going to do it. And so that's what he's trying to tell them here. Because basically, it's all about, you know, trusting God and those things that are in him, yes. And verse 21, and it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, and who has also put his seal on us, and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So what it comes down to is that, hey, guys, don't, don't feel left out. It's not like because I didn't show up in person that you're any less accepted by God, because it's God who establishes us. And look, he is the one that gave us Christ. That's the good news. He's anointed us. And look, he's the one that put the seal on us by giving him his Holy Spirit as our guarantee. And now, I'll tell you what, that's the, that's the seal of eternal security. When the Holy Spirit indwells us at salvation, that is our seal. That's basically, you know how it talks about the Antichrist, that you might get your, that chip in your hand or the mark on your hand or on your forehead? Well, that's their guarantee in the end times so that you can buy and sell and do all that stuff under the Antichrist, right? Well, our seal and guarantee is the Holy Spirit. And that is how 
That is how we are known to be part of the family of God when God looks down. He sees his Holy Spirit in us. That is our seal. That is our, he is our seal and our guarantee before God. And now that is awesome. When you think about that, it's kind of like, you know, I mean, I hate using this analogy. I probably shouldn't. But for those of you who have ever gone to a place where you get a stamp put on your hand so that you can come in and go out, you know, usually I think there are more bars that do that than anybody Night, else. Nightclubs, yeah. Yeah, nightclubs. Yeah. Never, well, never been there. <laughs> yeah, I've never been there. Say what? And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, when you look at that, that's. You told, right, what? Victor? <laughs> what? You've been told you haven't been there yourself, right? <laughs> Oh, never have, never, never have. I think they do it at like water parks and and theme parks and stuff like that sometimes yeah, yeah. too. Exactly. So, but those wear off, don't they? So if you if once you go into the shower, that mark's gone. But mm -hmm. for us, this sometimes is showers. <laughs> <laughs> but see, this is our guarantee, and the Holy Spirit is not removed from you once the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Okay. It's not like God says, okay, I'm going to take your Holy Spirit out of you now because obviously you don't deserve him anymore. No. Once you are in Christ Jesus and you've truly turned your life over uh, to him and accepted his free gift of salvation, repented of your sins, and, and the Holy Spirit indwells you, he is there for good. Okay? And that is our guarantee. And guess what? That's how we get into heaven. We get in because we got the ticket. The Holy Spirit is our ticket in. And because the Holy Spirit intertwines with our spirit and makes us alive. Dead spirits can't get into heaven. Only live spirits can get into heaven. And the Holy Spirit is who gave us life and who brought our spirits to life through Jesus Christ. Now, isn't that amazing? It's like, thank you, Lord. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Martin. I was going to say that, you, that that verse says basically that all the promise that are in the Bible to Christ Jesus is yes to us. Amen. There's no no. We have, you know, it's our promises, you know, that belong to us to, through That's Christ right. Jesus. Because we're in the family of Christ now. We're in God's family. And all yeah. of those promises that apply to those that are in God's family are okay. yes because they That's apply amen. to us. They're all yes to us. Amen. There's no more condemnation to us. Amen. Romans 8 1, right? Amen. There is now no yes, condemnation. Yes, think about people. that. It's, it's sufficient enough reason for us to rejoice and to Amen. serve God. You know, we, we used to be on the left and on the right. I mean, you know, not politics, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> we, we no, are on God's sides, not because we chose, but because we chose us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and that's why we are solidly focused on going to heaven. I just... One of the guys that was in my, I think I was telling you about a gentleman that was in my life group before. His name was Larry Rash. He was when I taught foundations class at First Baptist a life group. And, uh, and before that, he was actually part of the singles group that I taught also. And I don't remember the name of that one. It was, foundations was the second one. And I forget what the singles group was that I mm -hmm. taught. But anyway. He was in both of those. He had been in both of those classes with me. And uh, he caught the coronavirus just about two weeks ago. And he passed away three days ago. Um, because his kidney shut down. That, you know, I mean, the coronavirus has its thing. But, and I'm going to his funeral Friday down in Tampa. But uh, when you look at that and you say, man, that is so awesome that he now is with the Lord, you know, that, I mean, that, that is such a beautiful picture, you know, that, I mean, and we had a big prayer group going, man, there's a Facebook link that, I mean, we had this really big prayer group going, and it's kind of like what we were talking about earlier in the prayer. It's, hey, sometimes, like Aunt Martin was saying, hey, God has his plans, and sometimes his answer is, I want it this way. And in this case with, you know, even though we were praying that Larry would heal and that, you know, he'd get through this coronavirus and everything, that wasn't God's plan, you know, but yet we were praying for him to hang 
to stay with us. Don't we have a desire like those that we care about and we love and we have a tight relationship with? We want them to, we're selfish. We want them to stay here. But yeah. look, God had a better plan for him. And yeah. I, I mean, I, it shocked me the day that they put on the Facebook that, oh, Larry went to go be with the Lord today. And I was like, yeah. well, hallelujah. Yeah, Martin. Yeah. And Ted, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's final healing. Because that's you know it. what? That's it. No more sickness for him. Amen. No more sorrow. It's, it's over. No more pain. Uh, you know, because like you said, sometimes we pray, oh, God heals this person. But at the end of the prayer, it should be your God, will be done. Your will be done, not Amen. mine. I want that person to be healed, but Amen. let your will be done, not mine, because you, you know best. Amen. And, that, and that's, what, that's it. That's usually what I pray, but I know a lot of people don't like hearing that I will be done, Lord, because we get selfish. We want it our way, don't we? But look what Jesus prayed in the garden. Didn't he pray, hey, I'd, I'd love you to take this cup from me, Lord, but not my will, but thine be done. And, and we need to take a lesson from that. But you're right. And, and to me, that would be the most selfish thing I could ask for is for him to hang around on this world when it's God's time to take him. You know, it's like, hey, man, hallelujah. As a matter of fact, I'm jealous, Larry. Why did you get to go before me? <laughs> you know, well, it's just not God's time for me yet. God, that is God's will. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so look at what he says in verse 21. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So in other words, what he's talking about is, hey, we're all in this together, and the Holy Spirit is our uniting strength, and he's also our guarantee, and he's also the one who gives us strength to be and reflect the body of Christ in the way that brings God all the honor and the glory. That's what he's talking about. And he's saying, hey, we've got a beautiful thing going here. Let's make it right to bring God the honor and the glory. And it's all about this experience of grace. That's really what it comes down to. Up there in verse 15, where he's talking about this second experience of grace is what he was hoping he could come and do. But see, experience of grace is anything that we do that we come together as a unity to develop and to be more like Christ and to bring God the honor and the glory, whether it be through worship, through praise, through Bible study, through going out making disciples, through building up disciples, through anything that God has called us to do that we do with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength to bring him all the honor and the glory. And that's what Paul's talking about here as he's wrapping this thing up, because we're all in it together. All of us that are in Christ Jesus globally are in it together. And of course, we locally here too are in it together through Christ Jesus. I mean, and that's what he's bringing out here is that stop looking and stop feeling snubbed by the fact that I didn't get there because I couldn't make it on my own fleshly schedule and God didn't allow it through his schedule for me. So don't feel that way. We're all already united. Even if I'm not here, whether I'm over there or here, it's kind of like, you know, I'm, we're all with each other anyway, if we have them up in prayer. And that's what he was talking about in prayer, that no matter where we are in prayer, we are still united and connected together regardless. And that's what he's bringing out here as he wraps up chapter one. So um, let's see here. Oh, wait, hang on, hang on. Oh, verse 23. I'm sorry, not quite tr finished yet. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrain from coming against the corn. Now, now he's trying to make it clear, more clear to them as to why he didn't show up. Uh, but I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrain from coming again to corn. So God had a different plan, and it would have been, think about it, if he had come, Remember how, how strong his letter to them was in 1 Corinthians? I think that what he's saying is, hey, if, if I had shown up, if God had allowed me to go there, I, I mean, it, it would have been a lot rougher in my interaction with you uh, addressing these issues that were going on. So he's saying, 
that spared you since I did not, since I refrained to come to Corinth. In other words, he didn't come. He refrained because, well, God had a different plan for him, right? Let's take a pause. That's it. So he says, now that we lord it over your faith, not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. So in other words, he's more concerned about their faith and their growth in Christ, not about the visit per se. And so that's what he's looking forward to, and that's what he's addressing. Now, remember, there's been a one-year period. Timothy would have come and already talked to him, because Timothy would have probably been the one that delivered this letter, the first letter to them. He would have taken back what he had seen based on them looking at the letter and what, what Timothy had been done to interact with them. He would have taken this back to Paul. And so based on that, that's where this second letter came from. And he's talking to them about, hey, look, we, the main thing is, is that you need to get totally on track with following the Lord Jesus Christ and not fall off the wagon, you know, based on the situations that we had already enumerated back in the first letter I sent to you. So that's his focus in terms of what he wants. He wants the best for them. Hey, Paul is not in this first chapter saying, hey, you guys are falling short and you guys are, have all kinds of problems. What he's trying to do is just trying to build them up to tell them, hey, look, guys, come on. You know, I mean, God wants the best for you. We want the best for you. And this was the best way it could have worked out. Now, keep us in your prayers and we keep you in our prayers and I'll, we'll continue to work together because that's how the body of Christ does. So that's what he's talking about. He says, it's not that we want to lord it over to you. It's not that we're more, you know, we're be, to be considered better than you, uh, but it's to work with you, okay? Isn't that what the body of Christ is supposed to be? We're supposed to love one another and work with each other, care with for one another. I mean, that's what he's talking about. But we work with you, not over you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. It's all about being in Christ, trusting him, because that's what faith is all about. Faith is about those things we can't see, right? But yet we accept because they are God-given. That's what faith is about. And that's what he's talking about, is that we work with you so that we stand together in unity before our wonderful sovereign God. That's chapter one. Any questions, comments, additions, subtractions, disagreements? Pretty thorough. Kind of hard to have any questions. Mm -hmm. Well, praise the Lord for that. I mean, everybody <laughs> contribute, and that's, that's good. I mean, as we contribute, that's how we learn together. And uh, so we, we see that Paul's got a plan going on here. Uh, and we'll see him in verse, in chapter 2. He'll still be talking about that visit that he didn't do, okay? Because obviously, as, as Martin had indicated, they feel snubbed. They feel like, hey, you left me out. You know, you, you should have come. But isn't that how we are today sometimes? Hey, if we had, we're expecting some real popular pastor to come as a guest speaker, and all of a sudden he has to change his schedule because, well, God didn't allow it. Don't we sometimes feel like, oh, man. We should have had that pastor here. Man, I know that God would have really blessed us with him here, but yet that wasn't God's plan. Well, in essence, that's that same type of situation. I, I, I mean, I've been at churches where they felt snubbed because somebody had to change their plans and couldn't make it, you know, and you thought that they were going to be there and that kind of thing. Now, of course, Paul was considered an apostle. So back then that was a, a something good. Uh, to be visited by an apostle. If Cephas came, for instance, or Peter, uh, they would have been like, yeah, we got Peter here, for instance. So, I mean, it's that kind of thing. That's the type of issue that I think Paul is trying to defend here and that he'll continue to address to some extent in chapter two. I think that happened to Robert Morris one time when he was at our church. Really? He, he was ill or something. He couldn't go through all three services. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Saturday night, they recorded the service, and on the other two services, they played it on the big monitor. Oh, okay. Well, at least they got that. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So, okay. 
Well, then, in that case, then, we'll pick up in Chapter 2 next week, and we'll go from there. So any final questions or issues that you want to talk about before we take prayer requests? So we're going to pick it up in August, huh? Yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, a mate. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. Another month gone. I cannot believe that yeah. we're into the eighth month of this year already. Man, oh. no kidding. And, and, well, think about it. March was the time frame for this coronavirus. March thirteenth, Friday thirteenth. Man, March. we're almost four oh. months already. Full four, four full months already into it. Man, it doesn't seem like that long. Man, in a way, yes, and in a way, it seems like it's been longer. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I think we got a tropical storm. If we, if it stays where they're predicting it, I guess we'll feel it this weekend, huh? Yep. Yep. Sunday it is. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So, well, thank God at least it's not a hurricane. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, it'll be mostly rain. I'm thinking more than it is wind per se. I mean, we'll get. You saying it's a? You saying it's a hurricane? No, it's. They're saying it's just going to stay at tropical storm level. I think it's only at 40, 40 knots with 50 knot gusts or something like that right now. And I don't think they're expecting it to strengthen much more beyond that. You missed it, Ted. Yeah, so. You missed it. What did I miss? You call it a hurricane and I call it a hemicane. Oh, oh, okay, <laughs> hemicane then. <laughs> yeah, when it's got a man's name, it's a hemicane. Oh, oh, I got, oh. The man, I had to be educated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Isaias or something, Isaias or something. Like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any prayer requests, folks? We'll pray for the prez. And of course, this coronavirus. That's pray for we can get another stinking lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, that guy Especially give wisdom. On a water rafting trip. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Continued healing of Pastor David. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. I haven't heard. I mean, he should. Has he? Has he made any appearance yet? He did last Sunday. One on one. Sunday. Oh, okay. I figured it was about the time that he should be able to appear, not to do a whole service, but to appear. Yeah, so that wife, means he's. He and his wife both stood up. Wave to the crowd, wearing their big white mask. Okay, well then, then he's on the right track. He's recovering based on what they said. Then okay, good. So yeah, we'll keep praying for him for full recovery. Yeah, I guess he's waiting for the doctors. Go ahead. Exactly. Well, and right now, you know, doctors are going to be pretty hesitant with him just by yeah. virtue of the fact while he's recovering. You know, your system isn't as strong against any potential illness. So I'm sure they'll try to keep it care keep him in a careful way. Yeah. Makes sense. Keep him in a lockbox. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Let's pray then. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for an opportunity to come together to study your word. And we thank you for now getting us into this letter to the Church of Corinth, this second letter to the Church of Corinth. I pray that you would continue to develop us and that we would see the wonder of those things that Paul was telling to the Corinthians and how they apply to us today. I mean, once again, I mean, obviously something that we know, but we need to keep active is corporate prayer. I think we need to be more active. I mean, when you look at a lot of these churches today, I mean, they don't even have prayer meetings anymore. You know, the ones, you know, typically when you went back about 50 years, maybe even not even that far, I mean, all the churches had a Wednesday night prayer meeting, you know, where prayer was an essential part. And we've kind of set that aside. Sometimes we'll put like a little prayer insert into our bulletins or something like that and just leave it at that. But I mean, I think there is something powerful about coming together as the body of Christ and lifting up those prayer requests together. And Lord, I just pray we get back to that because, I mean, just as Paul was talking about in his letter today, that prayer works both ways. It works, you know, for the people that are out 
on the road or as missionaries, as well as the collective well-being of the body of Christ and the unity, the tying together of us all through prayer. So prayer is essential and it, it has power, you know, uh, when we use it that way. Lord, help us to be able to develop in that. And also, you know, really like in the, and you know, how you comfort us through any of our problems that we may be going through, through any suffering. And it will come. If we haven't had it, it will come if we stand up for you, Lord Jesus. And, and, but what we, ha what we have to realize is that no matter what we go through, you will be there to comfort us. And we can have comfort through it, not only individually, but collectively as the body of Christ. And we should realize that too. It's not just about us individually, but about us as a unity together and receiving your strength and your comfort regardless of what suffering we may have to endure in your name. So, Lord, we look to you, we praise you, and we honor and we glorify you through that. Now, Lord, I pray for our president. Give him wisdom as he's, you know, trying to run this country and the difficult matters that he's having to deal with. I mean, I know you can give him wisdom, but I pray that somehow he would act on that wisdom that you give him, Lord. So we trust you in that respect that you will, you know, just give him all the right stuff to do, and I pray that he will act on it. Now, Lord, I also pray for this coronavirus thing that's going on. It's still problematic, and you know it, Lord. Nothing's hidden from you. We just pray, you know, for safety for those that are nurses and those working on the front line, having to work with people. I mean, it really came to light to me this last week as I was praying for my brother, uh, uh, Larry Rash, as he was dealing with it, because this is the first person I've known personally and had a relationship with that had contracted the virus. He drove himself to the hospital, checked himself in, and within a week and a half, he's gone to be with you, Lord Jesus, and I praise you for that, that he's up there. And I ask Jesus, just give him a hug for us. Lord, I look forward to our time when we will have the opportunity to be glorified and be up there with you with no more sorrow, no more pain, but that we will get to be with you forever and ever. And that's the beauty of it that we look forward to. That's the hope. And we thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit as our guarantee. Thank you, Lord, for that. I also pray for Pastor David. We ask and pray that you will continue to help him throughout his recovery that he would be brought back to us in full health, Lord, and totally recovered. We thank you that he's already been making an appearance, so he's on track, and we know that you've got your hand involved in that, and we praise you for all that you have done and are doing and will do. So we thank you for that. Now, I pray for all of our families, too. That's always a challenge that we have in our lives, whether it's witnessing to them, whether it's trying to help them through difficult times and they just won't listen, or, or whether it's just they need some love from us. Let us be there for them, Lord, in a way that brings honor and glory to you. And let us not be antagonistic or judgmental, but loving and caring and letting them know about Jesus if they don't, and helping them get to know Jesus better if they know him, but just really haven't gone far enough. Let us, but let us do it in a spirit of love in a way that shows that you are awesome and wonderful, not in a condescending, judgmental, you know, way that alienates them, but in a way that brings them closer, that you, Holy Spirit, can do the work in and through their hearts. Now, be with all of us as we go. Keep us safe. Let us be, you know, who you would have us be, vessels ready for your use in a way that honors and glorifies you. We thank you, and we love you, and we praise you. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good yeah. Good yeah, good night. Good night, Martin. Good night, good night. Uh, Lynn. Lynn, great having you here. Thank good night, Gene. Good night, Aaron, my brother. Good night. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> good night. Hey. Yeah, Andy <laughs> took off before I could say good night, Andy. So, <laughs> good night, Donna. Good night, Ted. Yeah. Good night, Margaret. God bless you, my sister. Good night, Dan. I'll see you on Sunday Sally. afternoon. You got it. I don't know where she is. Uh, she must have had some. Oh, I think I think my great niece called her. Her grandchild. I I heard 
Skype do coming across out our door as I was walking back here to start the lesson. So she might have gotten tied up with Elizabeth. Okay. So, yeah. Well, good night, Rick. Good. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome, my brother. God bless you. Take care. Bless you. And we'll see you Saturday. Amen. Okay. Bye bye. Okay.